Yep. All right. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our Friday Colloquium. Um, I'm very glad to host Jenny Bergner. Um, she's from the University of Chicago. She's the current Na NASA Sagan postdoctoral fellow there. And she's housed at the Department of Geophysical Sciences coming directly from Harvard from her PhD, where she tells me she was a colleague of Elizabeth Newton. So Elizabeth, I hope you are there and you'll be asking questions. I just already apologize that we can't go out to dinner after the talk, maybe some other time. Um, so Jenny is interested in astrochemistry, protoplanetary disks, and the delivery of uh, ingredients for life to nascent planets, which of course is very important for our planet and potentially for other planets out there. So, and the title of her talk is uh, The Volatile Reservoir of Planet Forming Disks. Okay, Jenny, so welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, glad to be here. I hope to visit in person at some point. Um, but yeah, my talk is about the volatile reservoir of planet forming disks. <clears throat> All right, so we know that planet formation is a common outcome of the formation of low mass stars similar to our own sun. And this process begins in a molecular cloud where at some point you have an overdensity that begins to collapse in on itself forming a protostar. So in the protostellar stage, you're accreting material possibly through a protostellar disk from this protostellar envelope. And then in the subsequent stage, the protoplanetary disk stage, we've cleared away the envelope and we're left with just this flattened disk-like structure that's still um, accreting onto the central star. And this is really where uh, we think much of the planet formation process takes place. So ultimately the sort of excess disk material is also swept away and then we're left with just the isolated planetary system. So uh, we can see that the composition of planets that you form in these uh, young systems are going to be set by the composition of gas and solids in these planet forming disks. So ultimately, if we wanna be able to form things like the organic biomolecules like we here, have here on earth, we then need to inherit the precursors for this chemistry um, from the disk. So we can think of sort of the uh, minimum requirements for organic biochemistry on earth are a set of elements that we refer to as CHOMPs, not the nicest acronym, but <laughs> maybe we'll work on that. Um, so this is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And these elements are found in all life forms on Earth. So if we think that uh, life on other planets um, follows sort of similar organic chemistry, then this is really the sort of suite of elements we need to be looking for. So the big question that I'm interested in is understanding how physics and chemistry are interacting through these various stages of star and planet formation to ultimately shape the vol volatile inventories of these biocritic elements that are inherited by nascent planets. All right, so there's two sort of key features of volatile uh, delivery that we're interested in. The first is sort of the, the rougher way to think about things is just what's the total inventory of these biogenic elements in planet forming gas and solids? So this is just a question of how much raw material is delivered and we don't really uh, think too much about the form that it's delivered in. But the other way of thinking about it is what is actually the degree of chemical complexity that these ingredients are delivered in and is it actually sort of ending up on planets in a prebiotically useful uh, molecule that could play a role in jumpstarting the chemistry. So these are just sort of two approaches that we can use when we're thinking about the delivery of these ingredients. So um, kind of along the second point, one of the most prebiotically interesting class of molecules um, out there is a group of molecules called nitriles. So for any non-chemists in the room, a nitrile is a molecule with a carbon-nitrogen triple bond, also sometimes called a cyanide. So we're really interested in this chemical family in particular because in a number of sort of pl plausible prebiotic chemical schemes, nitriles really are kind of sitting at the center of these chemical syntheses of things like RNA, protein, and lipid precursors. So in this particular framework, we see hydrogen cyanide sitting right at the center of this synthesis. So studying how this group is distributed in planet forming disks can then uh, kind of tell us something about whether this plausible prebiotic building block is commonly delivered uh, to young planets. 
So using these nitriles as an example, I want to sort of illustrate the huge improvements that we've seen recently in our ability to study chemistry in discs. And that's thanks in large part to this telescope called ALMA. So as far back as the 1990s, we were able to detect um, the emission from simple nitrile molecules like CN and HCN um, towards proto protoplanetary disks. But the emission was spatially unresolved, meaning that we can't really tell where it's coming from within the disk. We just get a single spectrum for the entire object. Um, in the 2010s, we were able to actually map the emission of these simple nitriles on the sky. And so this gives us a bit more information about where these molecules are actually present in the disk. And then around the same time, we were able to detect the emission from more complex nitriles like cyanoacetylene shown here. But again, the sensitivity was pretty limited, so we can only get a single spectrum for the entire disk. And it's only since 2015 that we've been able to actually map the emission of these more complex species on the sky. Um, and that's thanks uh, to this telescope ALMA, like I mentioned. So really unprecedented uh, spatial resolution, as well as sensitivity, that's pushing forward our ability to characterize the, the emission of these more complex species in disks. So um, we're only beginning to be able to address questions like what is the role that these larger or sometimes called complex uh, nitriles play as carriers of the CN group? And more broadly, what is the role of larger organics as a volatile reservoir within the disk? So until recently, this one detection in over 2015 was the only example of these complex nitriles in a disk. And so expanding our sample size is early high priority to start to address some of these questions. So in 2018, we performed the first survey uh, looking for complex nitriles in a sample of six protoplanetary disks. And we found in the case of methyl cyanide, um, three firm detections of this molecule in the sample of six disks as well as two additional tentative detections. And in the case of cyanoacetylene, we had uh, five firm detections out of our uh, six disk sample. So now that we actually have the sensitivity to look for these more complex molecules, we're finding that they're actually quite common in disks. And we can go a little bit further and place some constraints on how important these complex molecules are as volatile carriers. So for the two brightest disks in our sample, we do what's called an abundance retrieval, where we um, use a disk physical model that describes the te temperature and density of the disk as a function of position in the disk. And then we fit just a simple radial parametric abundance profile to derive um, the abundances of these species in the disk. So this is an example showing um, the observations of this emission as well as our model. And you can see that just the simple parametric model does a really nice job of capturing the emission that we're seeing. And then we end up with these uh, profiles here. So the y-axis is showing the abundance of the complex species relative to the simpler nitrile carrier, HCN. And the x-axis is showing the radius in the disk. So what we're finding is that in the inner 100 AU or so of the disk, methyl cyanide is sort of a moderately important carrier between about one and 10% with respect to HCN. But cyanoacetylene um, is a pretty important carrier. At times it's as abundant as HCN. So I think the big takeaway here is that these complex nitriles are actually important carriers of the nitrile group at the radii in disks where comets and planets are forming. And so when we're thinking about how um, these kind of prebiotically interesting elements and functional groups are delivered to planets, we do need to consider the contribution of these larger species as well. Okay, so what about oxygen? The sort of um, analogous large organic to methyl cyanide is methanol. And methanol is the most commonly detected um, organic of any kind detected towards prestellar and protostellar sources. So in these earlier evolutionary stages, methanol is very, very commonly detected. So what was really surprising is that um, methanol has only been detected towards a single protoplanetary disk to date. This is towards TW Hydra, the nearest disk that we can study. And it was really a kind of wimpy detection compared to what we were expecting from these earlier evolutionary stages. So this uh, kind of lack of detection isn't for lack of trying. There have been a number of searches that have really tried to um, 
to constrain the methanol abundance in discs, but it just simply isn't present at the abundances we expect it to be. So to sort of summarize what we know, in this one disc sheet of rehydra where both methyl cyanide and methanol have been detected, the ratio between these two molecule abundances is of order unity. And in two discs where we don't have um, methanol detections, but we do have fairly constraining upper limits, um, the, the ratio is again consistent with about unity. So this is in contrast to other stages of low mass star formation. So in the earlier evolutionary stages, you can see we're one to two orders of magnitude lower in methyl cyanide relative to methanol. So something very strange is happening in the disc stage where the nitrogen bearing organics are strongly enhanced relative to the oxygen bearing organics. And it turns out that this problem of missing oxygen is not only um, happening for the larger organics, it's actually also happening for the smaller oxygen carriers as well. So this is a summary figure from a paper earlier, I guess last year now, it's 2021, um, but this is really building off of a lot of previous work. And we're showing the um, CO abundance as a function of age in the disc. And you can see that in this uh, protoplanetary disc stage, most of the sources that we study are underabundant in CO by one to two orders of magnitude relative to the ISM CO abundance. And the story is really similar for water, again, showing the water abundance as a function of evolutionary stage. And in the one protoplanetary disk where we have a good water measurement, we're many orders of magnitude underabundant in water. So all this just um, supporting the same idea that oxygen really seems to be missing from the gas by the protoplanetary disk stage. So there's a very compelling explanation um, for why this might be happening. And it has to do with how the chemistry is coupled to physics um, during the evolution of the disk. So the idea is that in a young disk, you have small dust particles that are sort of distributed vertically throughout the disk. And these dust particles are coated in um, ices, things like water and CO. So as the disk evolves, you have grain growth and settling that locks a lot of these um, dust grains in the mid plane and they uh, sort of trap their icy mantles with them. So you end up in these more mature disks with a mid plane that's very rich in things like CO and water ice and an atmosphere that's depleted in gas phase oxygen and carbon. So the oxygen sequestration in the mid plane can sort of explain why we see very low abundances of oxygen carriers in the gas. Um, but it's also predicted to have a number of other chemical effects on the sort of total uh, disk gas chemistry. So here I'm showing um, a modeling result from Fujian Du in 2015. And we see on the y-axis the column density of different chemical families within the disk as a function of radius in the disk. And the dashed line is showing an oxygen depleted uh, uh, chemical scenario compared to the solid lines which are showing the kind of fiducial full oxygen abundance. And we see that in the oxygen depleted case, the abundances of molecules like cyanides and hydrocarbons are orders of magnitude higher than in the full oxygen case. So we expect that the formation of molecules in the cyanide and hydrocarbon families should be boosted in this oxygen poor gas. And this again fits with this picture of high abundances of things like methanol, or I'm sorry, methyl cyanide in discs, but low abundances of molecules like methanol. So this framework can really nicely explain the abundance patterns that we're seeing in a few individual sources, but it, until recently, it hasn't really been tested in any systematic way. So we set out to do this using a handful of small molecules. Um, we're not at the stage where we can actually assemble a large enough sample of the large organics to test frameworks like this, but we can use smaller molecules. So in our sample, we include HCN, which is a member of the nitrile or cyanide group, um, C2H, which is a member of the hydrocarbon chemical family, and then C18O, which is an oxygen carrier. So we conducted an ALMA survey of 14 protoplanetary disks spanning in ages uh, less than 1 million years to greater than 10 million years. So uh, this is just a snapshot of a few of the disks in our sample, showing the emission of C2H, HCN, and C18O in these disks. 
So it's really beautiful data. It's giving us an opportunity to actually test chemical frameworks and to do so in an evolutionary way where we can start to look at the effect of age on the chemistry. So again, our expectation from this oxygen depletion framework is that in disks that are more evolved, you should have more grain evolution, which is locking your oxygen in the mid plane. So observationally, we should see lower CO abundances in the gas, as well as enhanced uh, formation of molecules like HCN and C2H. So when we assemble all of the sort of analysis of these observations, what we have here is the column densities of C2H and HCN plotted against C18O. And our prediction from this framework is to see an anti-correlation between C2H and HCN with C18O. Um, but in fact, you can see we have just a basically pure scatter plot. <laughs> if anything, we have a sort of weak positive correlation in the abundances of these molecules. Um, so this is kind of perplexing. We also notice that the um, the disks are roughly sorted into age by um, sort of less than 4 million years and greater than 4 million years, shown in the pink and purple points. And we see no real um, trends with disk age in terms of the chemistry of these three molecules. So all of this is sort of at face value, not really fitting with our predictions for this oxygen depletion scenario. But uh, more recent modeling is showing us that this prediction might not have been sort of fully accurate in the first place, because it turns out that while, um, so basically these are um, chemical models showing the column densities of C2H and HCN as a function of disk radius. And in this particular model, they actually varied the C to O ratio of the gas from very low values to very high values. So these higher values are corresponding to more oxygen depletion. And you can see that at lower values of C to O ratio, HCN and C2H are really sensitive to the C to O ratio. But above a ratio of between one and two, we really saturate this effect and the C2H and HCN abundances stop responding to further depletion of oxygen from the gas. So we think that this is perhaps the regime that we're in. If the C to O ratio is already high enough by the onset of protoplanetary disk stage, then we wouldn't really expect to see any correlation or anti-correlation between C18O -no with C2H or HCN because basically this effect saturates and then other chemical factors are going to regulate the relative abundances of these molecules. So this is, I think, really interesting because it implies that in the disk gas, the C to O ratios are much, much greater than solar. Um, so the solar C to O ratio is about 0.5. So we're seeing huge enhancements in the C to O ratio in the disk, which is really indicative of a, a really um, large scale sort of reshuffling of our elements among different phases and carriers in the disk. And whatever is sort of driving this trend is happening even for the young disks in our sample since we don't see any clear dependence on the disk age. So we've seen that in um, these protoplanetary disks, the gas shows this pattern of being depleted in oxygen carriers and enhanced in nitrile and hydrocarbon carriers. And we infer from the abundance patterns between these chemical families that the C to O ratio is probably greater than one. Um, but we know that the protoplanetary disk is sort of a product of what happens in the protostellar stage. And so a really interesting question now is to try to understand at what stage in the disk lifetime are these conditions actually set? And this is becoming even more important to understand in light of growing evidence that the earliest stages of planet formation are actually underway already in the protostellar disk stage. So historically, it was thought that planet formation was really ongoing, mostly in the protoplanetary disk stage once the envelope had cleared. But these are some really beautiful observations of disks that are still embedded in their parent envelopes. And we see these substructures in the dust that is indicative of grain growth and evolution already happening at these very early stages. So naturally, this begs the question, how does the volatile chemistry evolve throughout the entire planet formation time scale if these sort of early stages of planet formation are happening in the embedded stage? And at what stage does oxygen depletion become important and start to regulate the chemistry um, like we saw in the protoplanetary disks? 
So we um, set out to try to answer some of these questions using a chemical survey of protostellar disk candidates. So we have five um, sources, three are class zero or less evolved, and two are class one, which are slightly more evolved protostellar disks. And they're all from the Serpens uh, star forming region. So here I'm showing a suite of molecular line observations for three of the sources in our sample. And what you're looking at is in grayscale is like the total integrated intensity of the line. And the red and blue contours are showing the emission that's moving either towards us or away from us. So we can see sort of how the material is moving within these sources using kinematics. And what's really interesting is um, these, these are obviously much messier sources to look at compared to protoplanetary disks because they're still embedded in the envelope and they have things like outflows that protoplanetary disks no longer have. But when you sort of look only at the small spatial scales, we can see signatures of rotation that's consistent with the protostellar disk itself. So using a combination of uh, high resolution observations and these line kinematics, we can actually sort of start to isolate the emission that's coming from this embedded disk itself and study the evolution of the chemistry in these uh, young sources. So again, we wanna come back to this question of what is the evolution of CO depletion? Or in other words, when does oxygen begin to become depleted from the disk gas? So here I'm showing the C18O abundance um, from our source sample as a function of age in the disk, their age of the disk, and the yellow and orange points are the protostellar disks, and the pink and purple ones are the protoplanetary disks from that larger sample we talked about earlier. So um, the sort of biggest caveat here is that c 18 emission may be optically thick um, for these sources. So this means that the line emission effectively saturates and will cause us to under predict the true abundances based on the fluxes that we're measuring. So we don't wanna compare with a ISM standard. We wanna compare with a slightly more conservative standard that accounts for uh, some of these optical depth effects. But even with this conservative benchmark, it still is difficult to reconcile the class one disks with an ISM abundance of c 18 so we think that there's probably um, at least a factor of 10 depletion in CO by the class one stage. And then that's sort of propagated throughout the class two stage with a factor of 10 to 100 in CO depletion. So based on this, we are inferring that the CO depletion process is taking place on a time scale between half a million and a million years right around this class one stage. And this um, fits well with our inferences from just looking at protoplanetary disk chemistry, where we need the gas to already be oxygen poor, even in the young protoplanetary disks, in order to explain uh, some of the chemical patterns we are seeing. So indeed, we find evidence that this depletion is happening early in the disk lifetime. So we can use this data set to look at some other differences in the chemistry as these sources are evolving. And one of the sort of most important chemical drivers in these objects is uh, photons, especially UV photons. So when we look at protoplanetary disks, um, one of our best uh, photochemistry tracers is C2H. And we can see this really bright, beautiful emission of C2H that's sitting right on top of the dust disk. Um, but when we look at C2H in the protostellar disk, we notice that the C2H emission looks really different. So um, instead of having this really bright, compact um, emission, we see instead this really sort of fluffy, diffuse emission coming from C2H. And it's actually not even coincident with the millimeter dust disk at all. So what we think is happening is that the presence of an envelope in these younger sources is actually only allowing C2H to form within regions like outflow cavities that are exposed to UV from the central star. So in sort of a cartoon world, this looks like uh, this picture here where radiation is escaping through the um, outflow cavities and interacting with gas here. And that's leading to the sort of cone-shaped uh, morphology of C2H that we detect. In contrast, in the isolated protoplanetary disk without any envelope in the way, the entire disk surface is irradiated uh, by the central star and you end up with this really bright, robust production of these photochemistry tracers like C2H. 
So the more evolved disks really are host to this distinctive chemistry that's operating throughout the entire disk surface. And beyond just forming C2H, this photochemistry is going to play a role in altering the gas composition in these more evolved disks relative to the younger sources. So we also see the effects of this in other chemical tracers. I won't go into too much detail, but we can use the ratio between the uh, 15N and 14N isotopologs um, in uh, different molecules to trace the presence of a UV field, because basically um, 15N to 14N is enhanced in very strong UV fields. So in our observations, we covered HCN and HC15N. So we can sort of use this to look at the UV exposure in these protostellar disk sources. Um, so let's just focus in on this box part here, looking at the protostellar disk candidates. And we see that the HCN to HC15N ratio is decreasing um, really nicely with evolutionary stage within these protostellar sources. So I think this is really cool that we can actually sort of see the um, clearing of the envelope as these sources become more evolved and that this is driving the uh, 15N fractionation in the, the disk gas. So a really cool probe of sort of the effect that the envelope is having on the protocellular disk chemistry. The last uh, really interesting difference, I think, um, that I'll talk about between the protostellar and protoplanetary disks is the presence of a really bright organic molecule emission in the protostellar sources. So three of the five protostellar disks in our sample were detected with this warm methanol emission on these small spatial scales. And this is what we call in astrochemistry a hot Carino source. So it's not just methanol that we detect, there's a whole suite of other complex oxygen and nitrogen bearing organics that show up um, as well in these three sources. And what's happening here is basically you have uh, material falling in towards the protostar um, from the cloud. And as it reaches close enough to the protostar itself, it becomes warm enough to sublimate its ices into the gas phase. So you have this huge sort of dumping of organic material into the gas on small scales um, as a result of this sort of uh, ice rich material coming in from the outer regions. So this is not actually a universal feature of protostars. There have only been about 10 hot carinos detected um, previously. And there's actually a pretty lively debate in the literature about whether the emission of, um, of hot carinos is actually associated with the presence of a protostellar disk or whether it's a distinct feature of protostars. But at least from our survey, um, the fact that we detected hot carino emission towards three of the five protostellar disks in our sample, when we've only found 10 hot carinos previously, seems to suggest that these elements are perhaps actually connected. So the last thing I wanna highlight is that um, the detection of this really rich uh, gas phase organic chemistry in these young sources is really distinct from the more evolved protoplanetary disks, where as we saw before, it's really challenging to detect even methanol in a protoplanetary disk. So we have a much more uh, kind of robust inventory of organics at these earlier stages, at least in the gas phase where we can detect them. So just sort of to complete this picture then, we talked already about the, um, the features of protoplanetary disks that, um, that are quite distinctive. And now um, the protostellar disks, we can sort of add our, our inferences here as well. So we saw that CO depletion from the gas seems to be taking place on a time scale of about half a million to a million years around the class one stage. We saw that the envelope is playing a really important role in regulating photochemistry in the protostellar disks. And lastly, that ice sublimation from infalling envelope material can really drive a rich organic gas phase chemistry in the protostellar core in these earlier stages. So I think the big takeaway here is just that the volatile composition of planet forming material will vary throughout the disk lifetime. Um, if planet formation is beginning in these earlier sources, the conditions are quite different from in these more mature disks. And so really piecing together a complete picture of the compositions of planets and planetesimals is going to require us to understand this chemical evolution in detail. All right, so let's come back to this um, big picture here 
how does the physics and chemistry interact during storm planet formation to shape the volatile inventories uh, inherited by these young planets? So we've started to sort of address these questions um, for the gas phase chemistry, but that's um, also kind of the easiest chemistry to look at. So most of the volatiles in disks are actually frozen out onto grains as ices. So the gas phase is telling us a lot about the sort of physics in the disk and the um, observable gas phase chemistry, but we're not getting the complete picture if we're ignoring the ices. And to study ice chemistry in disks, we need complementary constraints because we can't probe um, ice compositions with millimeter observations. All right, so a large part of my PhD was working in the lab on this setup. This is an ultra high vacuum setup that has um, within this chamber um, pressures that go about 13 orders of magnitude below atmospheric pressure and temperatures that go down to around 10 Kelvin. So we can sort of simulate the conditions of these um, protoplanetary disk environments and then use experiments to try to understand how the ice phase chemistry will play out um, in a very controlled way. So this is just a schematic of the different tools we can use to study this chemistry. Within the chamber we have a cesium iodide window that's being cooled by the helium cryostat down to temperatures around 10 Kelvin. So we can release uh, volatile molecules into the chamber with this gas inlet and then they condense onto this cold window forming an ice layer. We can then use uh, infrared spectroscopy to monitor the ice composition in situ. And we can also monitor the gas phase uh, composition in the chamber using the quadruple mass spectrometer. And again, ultimately what we'd like to understand is what kinds of chemistry are active under cold mid plane like conditions and uh, allow us to gain some insight into what's going on in the ice phase that we can't directly probe with observations right now. So I wanna just give an example of how these experiments work, focusing on the formation of ammonium salts in ices. So again, any non-chemists out there, a salt is just an ion pair. So something like ammonium formate. So the motivation for studying this chemistry is that we actually detect ices, um, sorry, ions in the ice phase along protostellar lines of sight. So using a star as a backlight can basically measure the absorption of ices in cloud material along the line of sight. And this gives us spectra like what you see here on the left where we can see the absorption of different ice features. And the fact that we're detecting things like formate, OCN minus, ammonium, is kind of surprising because it's not really uh, intuitive that you would be forming these um, ions actually in the ice phase. So we set out to try to understand uh, this chemistry a little bit better, studying the in situ formation of ammonium formate, um, reacting ammonia and formic acid together. So the way we do these experiments, we deposit a layer of ammonia ice underneath a layer of formic acid ice. And then we can watch in the infrared as over the course of warming, for instance, we grow new uh, features in the infrared. So these new features that we're seeing are actually corresponding to the ammonium and the formate uh, peaks that we're interested in. Now to be quantitative about this, we wanna understand how much energy is actually required for these uh, salts to form. So we need to model the kinetics and we do this watching these uh, peaks grow in the infrared over the course of the experiment and then developing a growth curve uh, from this data. We then fit the growth curves with a kinetic model. So in this case, you can see that a, a two-step kinetic model is actually describing the reaction uh, better than a single step model. And so for each experiment, we pull out two rate constants from this fit um, corresponding to the two different steps of the reaction. And then when we perform these experiments at different temperatures, we end up uh, fitting a line to the data and the slope of this line is uh, proportional to the activation barrier. So by doing this uh, kinetic modeling, we determined that the formation of ammonium formate salt is a two-step process that has two different energy barriers. And what we think these energy barriers correspond to are a pre-reaction step, which is a dynamical step. So a molecule needing to either reorient or diffuse through the ice in order to find a reaction partner. 
And then the second step is the reaction step itself. So the chemical uh, barrier to proton transfer. And based on our kinetic modeling, we find that the activation barrier of the reaction step is quite low. So this step should be efficient at basically any temperature in the ISM. But the pre-reaction step has a higher barrier, and this will only be efficient at sort of lukewarm temperatures around 30 Kelvin or so. So the, the kind of takeaway here is that this organic salt formation is a diffusion limited process, and it's probably not going to be active in the coldest ISM regions, but it could still proceed in sort of lukewarm environments. And um, a really interesting feature about uh, these uh, organic salts is that they're a lot less volatile than their neutral counterparts. So this figure is showing an experimental temperature ramp. So we're looking at the gas phase concentration as a function of temperature with molecules coming off the ice at a sort of characteristic desorption temperature. And you can see that the ammonium uh, feature is uh, not coming off until around 200 Kelvin, whereas the ammonia itself without being part of the salt pair desorbs around 100 Kelvin. So these organic salts are much less volatile than their neutral counterparts. And this has really interesting implications for how we might retain nitrogen in the solid phase, even in environments where ammonia would have sublimated. So the reason I'm uh, sort of really interested in this chemistry again, is that ammonium salts were recently identified in the dust of Comet 67P by the Rosetta mission. So you can see on the left here, the reflectance spectrum of Comet 67P, and then compare that to this lab spectra uh, where ammonium formate is actually a main absorber and is really nicely describing the, uh, the observed reflectance spectrum. So I think this is a really sort of interesting um, way of storing nitrogen in the refractory phase. Again, this was detected in the dust, not the coma. So the implication here is that by forming these uh, ammonium salts, we might be able to retain nitrogen in planet forming solids at disk radii where ammonia would otherwise be in the gas phase. And this is also interesting because it tells us something about the history of this material. Um, the fact that we see products of diffusion limited chemistry in these cometary uh, bodies likely implies that there is at least some heating at some point in its history in order for this diffusion driven chemistry to take place. All right, so I think I've shown with this example that this type of lab experiments allow us to interpret and predict the ice chemistry that we see both uh, in the relics of our own protosolar nebula and also in other disk systems. However, um, lab experiments, like I said, are performed in these very controlled settings that let us get good constraints on the uh, mechanisms and energetics. But ultimately, understanding how this ice chemistry plays out in more realistic environments requires us to perform simulations. So for instance, um, within the disk, icy grains are exposed to a variety of different physical environments due to turbulent diffusion. So this is just showing a single micron sized particle that starts out in the mid plane. And then over the course of a million years due to this turbulent diffusion sort of wanders into various different disk environments. So understanding how um, in scenarios like this, the grain dynamics are actually impacting the chemistry of these planet forming solids is a really interesting question. And something that I'm especially interested in is trying to understand the extent to which pre-stellar or so-called inherited ices can survive their passage through the disk. Um, so there are a number of lines of evidence suggesting that cometary ices are in part inherited from the protostellar stage. This is an example showing um, the organic compositions of comet 67P compared to this very well-studied protostar. And you can see that the organic inventories of both are really extremely similar. So this is just one of many lines of evidence suggesting that there is some of this inheritance in the uh, compositions of icy bodies in our own solar system. So understanding if this inherited ice can significantly contribute to these uh, compositions of comets and other icy bodies, I think is a really uh, interesting question that we're trying to understand now. All right, so to get at this question, we're building a model that couples these uh, disk dynamical trajectories like I showed here with a protostellar ice-like model. So the, the uh, ice model 
left as shown here is a cartoon where we have a thick water rich ice layer and that's capped with a thinner CO rich ice layer. And this is informed by observations of protostellar ices um, from the ISM. So we can then track different forms of ice destruction. So among the ones that are supposed expected to be uh, most important in a disk environment is uh, thermal and UV uh, processes. So in the case of uh, thermal and UV photodesorption, we can simulate uh, desorption from this very kind of surface layer of the ice and then replenish this uh, desorbed material with ice from uh, deeper down within the mantle. And in the case of photodissociation, we can model how um, absorption of UV photons splits molecules into atoms and radicals, destroying these parent ice molecules, and that this effect is attenuated as you go deeper into the ice. So putting these dynamics together with a chemical model, we can then start to kind of simulate dif different outcomes of ices as they're journeying through the disk. So here I'm showing just four examples for a micron size grain. And you can see there's a number of different outcomes where in some cases your particle wanders basically straight into a more unshielded region of the disk and is basically obliterated. But in some cases your particle stays pretty safely within this shielded midplane region and survives throughout the entire million years of the simulation. This is also really dependent on grain properties. So we can see in this example, these are millimeter grain trajectories. And in basically all of these cases, the ice or the uh, dust particles are spiraling in and um, accreting onto the star on very fast time scales. So not a lot of these particles are actually surviving. So for each of these trajectories, we can then look at the composition of the ice as a function of time and learn something about sort of the relative chemical process that's going on to these ices <clears throat> during uh, their journeys. So this is in somewhat preliminary stages, but we're starting to assemble some interesting results, I think. So here I'm showing um, for particles starting at different radii in the disk and for particles of different sizes, the fraction of your original ice that's surviving on a 100,000 year time scale. So I think the first takeaway here is that some grains are experiencing significant ice destruction and that's especially happening for smaller grains that are um, uh, starting off at smaller radii within the disk. And this is because this destruction is basically regulated by how easily dust grains are lofted into the upper disk layers where they're exposed to UV. On the other hand, um, the white lines that you're seeing here is your sort of median ice um, survival. And so in most cases, um, we can see that the ices don't actually undergo significant thermal or photo processing. So while there are sort of a few of these interesting cases, it seems like um, the, the protostellar ice is largely surviving its journey through the disk. And this is good news if you're interested in sort of survival and incorporation of uh, protostellar material into planetesimals. We can also look more specifically at compositional effects. So here I'm showing the same grid of models, but instead of looking at fractional ice survival, we're looking at the ratio of C to O in all of the um, molecules within our ice. And we can see that for the, for the grains that do undergo destructive processing, they're showing really significant alterations to their compositions with C to O ratios dropping down um, to somewhat extreme levels compared to our starting point. So again, um, this is still very much a work in progress, but we're really excited to use this model to explore things like how do different disk structures impact ice survival, especially the role that pressure bumps might play in sort of trapping grains in particular regions of the disk, and ultimately for understanding what the implications of this are for uh, things like the cometary C to N to O ratios, and also the preservation of isotopic signatures in the ice. So I think I've shown that by synthesizing these three different approaches, we can assemble a more complete understanding of the solid compositions in the regions where planets are forming. So observations give us some indirect constraints on how volatiles are partitioned between gas and solids, and also gives us insight into the physical environment of the disk. Ice chemistry experiments give us a way to robustly measure the ice microphysics and chemistry in environments mimicking midplanes. And astrochemistry models 
give us a way to predict how this ice processing plays out in more complicated, realistic physical environments. Going forward though, what's gonna be really revolutionary for our understanding of ices in the disk is infrared spectroscopy. So infrared telescopes allow us to directly measure icy material, um, again, using absorption spectroscopy. So using the star as a backlight and an edge on disk, you can measure ice absorption along the line of sight. And this was done um, with the ACARI mission uh, in the last sort of decade or so, but with a fairly low um, sensitivity and spectral resolution that really limited our conclusions about the ice composition in disks. But in the coming years, the James Webb Space Telescope is going uh, hopefully actually to launch this year. And it's going to provide us orders of magnitude sensitivity or improvements in sensitivity and spectral resolution. And it'll also allow us to actually map ice absorption on the disk, again, giving us information about where, this, um, where these features are actually corresponding to spatially. So I'm really excited about this as a way to um, really complete our understanding of the volatile landscape within which planets are forming, since we have really few constraints uh, directly on the ices and disks uh, at present. But like I said before, they are expected to be really the major reservoir of volatiles within the disk. So this is going to be huge for us. All right, and with that, I will just summarize. Um, I've shown that planet formation takes place in protostellar and protoplanetary disks, and understanding the chemistry ongoing in these objects is really critical to predicting the content of volatile or organic material delivered to young planets. Um, with unprecedented sensitivity and spatial resolution, ALMA is really revolutionizing our understanding of this disk chemistry. So we can do things like characterize the chemistry of more complex organics, we can infer sequestration of volatile elements in the disk midplane, and we can disentangle the small scale components of protostars as well as uh, many other science goals. Using um, ultra high vacuum ice experiments, we can get key constraints on microphysical processes like desorption and reaction, allowing us to interpret and model chemical signatures in our own solar system and other disk systems. And we can put these pieces together using astrochemical simulations to link empirical co constraints from both observations and lab experiments. So the example I showed, we can make predictions about how ice chemistry is actually playing out in complex physical environments like disk planes. Lastly, uh, JWST will really deepen our understanding of ice compositions in disks, giving us direct constraints on the ice content uh, via absorption spectroscopy. So with that, thank you guys so much for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Um, I will clap on behalf of everybody. Let me uh, make myself seen here. OK, I'm clapping for everyone. <laughs> there you go. Um, that was great, uh, super important and detailed work. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If you have questions, raise your hand and then we can mic you up. Let me see. I don't see anybody. Oh, there is one. Oh, Elizabeth has a question. Okay. Hi, Elizabeth, I think you can. Can you talk now? Yeah. Uh, I think so. Yeah. It looks like. Cool. Uh, yeah, I was wondering you. Um, uh, you showed um, some models where the radius in the disk, like the chemistry was dependent on the radius in the disk. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was just wondering if you can observe the chemistry as a function of orbital radius. Is that possible with ALMA? Yeah, so to a greater and greater extent, um, we're a bit challenged in actually probing the sort of terrestrial planet forming regime right now, the best line survey um, observations go down to only about five AU in spatial resolution, but we can certainly see uh, radial trends in the outer disk. So on scales of sort of tens to hundreds of AU, we can definitely resolve uh, these differences in column densities. Okay, is that good, Elizabeth? Um... All right, any other, I have one question, but I'll wait until I wanna see if anybody else has something to say. Uh, I guess not. 
Okay, so so I have a, a question from an outsider. Um, for example, when you do, uh, when you try to find exoplanets using transit, right? You know that um, you're kind of sample limited just because you see the big guys before you can see the smaller ones just because of the way the technique works. Um, in your case, I was wondering if the kind of protoplanetary disk that we are able to visualize nowadays with the equipment that we have, if there is some sort of bias sampling there as well. And is that what, what you think about that and what you would expect to change in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're definitely guilty of that. Most of the disks that I showed are some of the biggest, brightest, most beautiful disks that we can see on the sky, um, just because that's where we can get these detailed chemical inventories and really resolve radial patterns in the emission. Um, there are definitely pushes to do more homogeneous surveys of more typical disks, but a lot of the really detailed studies have been done on a few sort of poster child <laughs> disks, definitely. And and. Do you think that will change in the next 10 years? I mean, what's the expectation of the community on this? Yeah, I know of at least um, two groups that are hoping to have sort of all my large programs to do these really ambitious studies of more typical disk systems. So the, the challenge is that it takes a lot of telescope time, but within the framework of a large program, that's certainly something that can be done. So I expect in the next, few years that this more kind of typical disk chemistry survey will will happen. Um, and yeah, five to 10 year time scale for results and updates to our um, current kind of thinking. Yeah, um, let's see. Okay, one more question since nobody else is asking questions. Um, so if you could go on a time machine, right? And um, look at the protoplanetary disk uh, that formed the earth uh, about 4.5 billion years ago, um, which one of the things that you have seen so far would come the closest from your sample, if there is any? <laughs> or are they really not similar at all? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good question. So um, many of the, like I showed the one plot comparing cometary and um, protostellar organic inventories. And in that case, we see really clear sort of compositional similarities between that object and ours. But I think one of the biggest challenges is that there's so much heterogeneity in what we detect within our own solar system mm -hmm. um, from comet to comet and meteorite to meteorite that it's not really clear what ours looked like and what the best sort of analog to it is. So hopefully sort of synergies between the comets and disk community can help us converge on what our solar system did look like originally, but I don't think that that's very well understood yet. That's great. Okay. Okay, folks, do you have any more questions for Jenny? One more one. Dean, Dean has one. Dean. Okay. Hi, Dean. Dean, welcome to this part of the world. Thank he's you, from, Marcello. He's from uh, chemistry. <laughs> Jenny, I'm, I'm chemistry. So all the chemistry was great. I want, loved it. Um, but a quick question about your observation that in the proto uh, planets, basically you have oxygen depletion uh, to the solids. So you'd think that in the ices and the solids, it would be more oxygen-based chemistry. Yeah, and, certainly. And, and yet, eventually, you're going to want to get the carbon materials from the gas phase on into the planets. Do you see the, the mechanism going forward? Um, so... I guess one thing to note is that Earth is actually very carbon poor. So actually a big challenge is figuring out how to lose a lot more carbon from the grains than we already have. Um, but yeah, I think understanding the details of planetary assembly is going to be really important to this because the, the exact mechanisms of planet formation are not well understood and that makes it hard for us chemistry people to really say this is the material that would have assembled Earth. Um, yeah, so I think understanding exactly where planet formation is feeding from will help us to sort of resolve any um, differences that are coming up. But, but the key observation here is that you start off with really oxygen rich materials and, 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 and chemistry at this very early stage. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. Awesome. At least that's sort of the inference. Like I said, mm -hmm. we can't directly measure ices yet, but James Webb will give us a much better handle on um, whether that's true. The alternative is, um, like I sort of alluded to in the modeling section, millimeter sized grains tend to be lost to the star really rapidly. So if it's not incorporated into larger planetary bodies, then it's basically just gonna be accreted onto the star. So that's another alternative is that we're just sort of losing a lot of this from the system. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any one more final question? Anyone? One, two, three, I guess not. Uh, 